So how are you, my beloveds? <laughs> Hanging in there? How have you been faring in the midst of all of this? This week has been extraordinary in its pace of change, hasn't it? I can't believe it was only last Sunday that we talked about the wisdom of women. Doesn't it seem like years ago that we did that service? So much has happened in this week. On Tuesday, I met with my staff and the congregation's leadership to put in place plans for phase one and two of this growing epidemic. At that point, it was still considered an epidemic. And we were planning to continue worshiping and meeting together while we put in place more thoughtful precautions like hand sanitizer everywhere and disinfecting surfaces and not touching and so forth. And then on Wednesday, we planned this Sunday's worship, not the worship you're seeing now, but a totally different worship. The choir was going to sing a fabulous piece for our special Love Your Neighbor service. And Willie and I also met to put in place final preparations for Thursday's interfaith Courage for the Common Good service, which was a year in the planning. And then on Thursday morning, news emerged from the California governor that large group gatherings were to be curtailed effective immediately. California Lutheran University decided it was important to cancel the interfaith service that night, together with their classes and other public events. Obviously understandable, but equally disappointing for all the planning that went into the special weekend honoring our neighbors. <coughs> Excuse me. That is not a cough cough. That's a... <laughs> She's healthy, folks. That's my throat is dry cough. Here at Chalice, we hoped that we could hold at least one more in-person worship this Sunday so that we could all connect face-to-face -face one more time before things got more locked down. After all, the virus hadn't really impacted our area yet. But then recommendations from the Centers for Disease Control came out about flattening the curve and for those of you who haven't seen that lovely diagram, I invite you to Google it after the service, Google flattening the curve. It shows that if the virus spreads too rapidly, it creates tremendous stress on our medical system and can easily overwhelm it, which is what's happening in China and in Italy. So if we can slow down the spread of the virus by social distancing, keeping people more separate and curtailing gatherings where people are too close to one another, then we have a better chance for our medical system to be able to cope with the onslaught. And it will also buy us more time to deliver testing and work on remediation. So by early afternoon on Thursday, the UUA was recommending canceling in-person services effective immediately. And Ventura County declared a state of emergency. By Thursday late afternoon, it was clear that we'd have to change all of our chalice plans from this weekend on and move into phase two immediately to keep everyone safe. As I shared with you in the email that I sent out that night, this phase means that we can no longer meet in person for the time being and our buildings are effectively closed except for limited staff access. We still have to pay bills, check our mail, pay our staff, things like that. But, my friends, church, our community, is not closed. Far from it. Woo! It's just taking a different form online during this time. And many of our amazing leaders, the staff and I, have been putting in long hours to recalibrate everything, to learn how to do online ministry within a few days. So whatever bumps have already occurred or have yet to occur, we hope you'll be patient with us. This time asks us to be enormously flexible and to stay in the moment without planning out too far while learning lots of new tools and techniques. And believe me, we're all more committed than ever to continuing Chalice's mission and activities online and even increasing our connectedness as a community. There, there are new yes. opportunities for connecting and getting to know each other in ways that maybe we couldn't even do on a Sunday normally. So probably like you, I've reflected a lot on these last few days. 
I've observed my own anxiety and fear and wondered, how are the rest of you all doing? Truthfully, I have to confess I've struggled a bit in the midst of all of the frenzy to find my own calm and center. The fear generated by the media and having to stay in touch with all the latest developments has swept me along. And also working so rapidly to shift everything online and completely change our worship services and church structure has made it challenging to still my mind and be able to access my wiser, more grounded self. And as I was reflecting on this, a memory came to me in the middle of the night. I didn't sleep much this week, so did a lot of thinking. And I remembered it was 1998 in Zimbabwe, a year when I was traveling around Africa with a friend. And my friend decided we should go whitewater rafting down the Zambezi River. And none the wiser, I agreed. It sounded like fun. It was one of the most beautiful and terrifying experiences of my life. I found out later that the Zambezi has some of the most dangerous rapids for whitewater rafting in the world. So unaware of this at the time, we floated along gently on our raft on this beautiful wide river, surrounded by lush scenery on both sides. Dramatic Victoria Falls were behind us, an absolutely stunning landscape all around. It was such a perfect day. I completely forgot about the crocodiles and the hippopotami that lurk in the calmer parts of this water. (laughs) So we were gently floating along, lured into complacency, breathing in the endless, glorious views, when all of a sudden, our raft got sucked into a rapid. And within a few seconds, our raft was being swept rapidly down the river. And clinging on desperately to the roped edges, we were tossed and spun, bouncing up and down, and then flying up in the air and slapping back down. And this crazy, almost angry wildness continued for what seemed like forever to me. We were on this hair-raising roller coaster ride with no safety bar in place. And we were all screaming initially with a mixture of excitement and terror, trying desperately to hang on to the raft for dear life. And then a huge wave hit us. Our raft with all of us on it, like an open matchbox with tiny matchsticks, was thrown wildly into the air and came crashing down upside down. And we all went flying and were flung violently into different parts of the river. And I remember the deadly crocs and hippos I told you about. Well, many people don't realize how dangerous hippos actually are, but they're not really your best friend in the wild. (laughs) But I wasn't thinking about that now. I ended up swirling in the undertow underneath the raft, not being able to get any air and not knowing which way was up or down. It was like being in a washing machine. And later I learned that that was exactly what this rapid was called. It was called the washing machine. And I was being spun mercilessly in every direction. I really thought I was going to die. I was gripped by panic and fear as I struggled to come up out of the water and find the surface to breathe. But the raft was on top of me and the rapids spun and tumbled me further under. I didn't know where I was or if I would ever find the surface and survive. And then all of a sudden, I was thrown to one side and managed to claw my way onto some weeds around me and finally got my head above water. I gasped for air, coughing and trying to get my bearings. And I clung to those weeds as if my life depended on it. It probably did. I prayed they wouldn't break off and send me back into the rapids. (sighs) Eventually, I was able to get myself to the edge of the riverbank. And it was then that I saw people from my group standing on the bank, waving wildly and gesticulating to me to keep hold of the bank. They motioned that I should move myself along the edge to a place where I could get out. Now, I wore glasses back then, and they were long gone, flung somewhere into the river. So I couldn't see well at all now, which made this even more challenging. But I knew inside what I needed to do bruised and bleeding, shaking from the terror. 
I made my way along the edge of the river, clinging onto the bank from one clump of greenery to the next. And with adrenaline coursing through my body, I was determined not to get swept back into the rapids. I took cover behind some large rocks where the water was calmer. Terrified, I would run into a crocodile. I'd actually only learn later that the crocodiles and hippos mercifully don't live in that part of the river. But I didn't know that then. Had that not been true, I probably wouldn't be here today. Eventually, I found a place where the edge was shallow enough that I could get out and crawl onto the riverbank. And when I was finally able to gather in the arms of my group that had made it out before me, I wept tears of relief. It was so good to be with this group of strangers who'd all had similar experiences of surviving this now death-defying experience. Now, some of you may be thinking, what the heck was Reverend Nika doing in a white water rapid like that when she had no experience? <laughs> well, she didn't think it through. I was young, naive, carefree, and eager to experience all that Africa had to offer. Africa was my time to take some chances for a city girl to live more freely without so much caution. And I guess we get the lessons we need most, don't we? Yes. <laughs> I'm grateful I survived because it taught me something I might not otherwise have learned. And it's the lesson I want to share with you today. Because I believe as a society, we're currently hitting a massive rapid like that. Aren't we? Up until a few years ago, many, many of us were able to mostly float along, to take in the scenery and feel comforted that our government and leaders were wise and had things under control. Life wasn't perfect by any means, don't get me wrong, and of course there were many people suffering, but there was a sense of normalcy. We had an inkling of what tomorrow might look like. It wasn't this huge unknown. But over the past few years, things have grown increasingly choppy for all of us in this river of life. Chaos, division, gaslighting, lies and fears have churned up the waters in our river and created potentially deadly undertoes. And if this wasn't enough, the crocs and hippos, AKA the coronavirus, have come out to feast. Anxiety is now a legitimate response to these rapids. And if you regularly watch the news or listen to NPR, it's easy to get spun out on the illusion of control by growing dread and news of impending worldwide doom. We're increasingly flung around not knowing what to believe or what is wise to do, aren't we? Of course, what we call the news is really only bad news. And so it highlights all the worst case scenarios, all the places around the world where they've become engulfed in the pandemic. Yeah. yeah. We need to start a good news channel that we can all watch, don't we? Please. Maybe this is one of the good news channels. Woo! <laughs> but my friends, no matter how scary things are, it's not sustainable for us to stay in this place psychologically for too long. To be healthy, wise, and to stay alive. We can't keep living with these levels of stress and fear. We're being tossed every which way, every hour of the day, as we worry quite naturally how the virus is going to impact us, our families, our friends, and our loved ones. And we know it will affect us all in some way. It already is. The economic impact alone will touch everyone. And the unusual thing about this whole thing, the entire world is affected all at once. We talk about climate change happening gradually over the years and decades and how it will affect us all, but a pandemic only takes weeks to do the same. 
No one is immune. Whether they actually catch the virus or not, we've seen it infect world leaders, famous actors and sports stars, everyone, whether they're rich or poor, white or black, Muslim or Christian, except perhaps the most remote <laughs> tribes and isolated places, everyone will be impacted by this pandemic. And almost every industry from sporting to entertainment, tourism, financial and education has been affected. I can't recall ever seeing the entire world being impacted in such dramatic ways all at once. This is unprecedented in most of our lifetimes. The polio outbreak in the 1950s and the Spanish flu in the early 1900s certainly affected many. But with the capacity for worldwide travel as it is now, as well as the ability for news to be disseminated so quickly via social media, and diseases, rumors, and fear, they all have the opportunity to spread and multiply so much quicker than ever before. So, my dear friends, we're going to be tossed around on the rapids of fear, contagion, rumor, and the unknown. But I urge you, if you can, find a way to crawl out of that fast-flowing current. Have faith that you will make it up for air, that you will find your way to the shallows at the edge of this river, or take shelter up against a big rock where there's a calm pool of water collected. Visualize standing on the bank in the arms of everyone who was in your life raft, having survived the dangers and the unknowns of this time. And our community is one of those life rafts that we can visualize coming together with again. It's hard knowing when things will return to normal, and it may not ever be the same normal, but eventually there will be some kind of stasis again. So meanwhile, I ask you, what are those places, those calm places in the river of life for you? What is your riverbank, your rock? Who are the people waving to you to guide you to a safer place? What helps you find calm amidst fear? What helps you center yourself so that you are able to breathe again and take deep breaths? What is your space of respite that allows you to refuel for the journey and gather strength? And who are the people you want to be standing with on the bank with tears of overwhelmed joy and relief knowing that you've survived? As I noticed myself getting tossed by the currents last week, I realized that I had to work on this very intentionally. Stressed by all the rapid changes and the lack of sleep, it can be easy to let your spiritual grounding practices slide. You might think to yourself, I don't have time right now to slow down. It's too hard to meditate right now. I have to fix this and reschedule that and, oh, buy toilet paper. I have to buy <laughs> toilet paper, right? Why is everyone buying toilet paper? and a six-month supply. <laughs> I must have to buy toilet paper too, right? <laughs> and I can't meditate when we only have one case of toilet paper in the house. And I know I'm supposed to walk in nature or write in my diary or exercise and eat healthy, but the reactive mind can take over so easily when the pace speeds up so much. But as you've certainly gathered by my tone here, this is the time when we need those practices most. Amen. This is the time when we should probably double down on those kinds of practices. Speak it. The things that ground and center us, right, my friends? Yes. Absolutely. The things that calm and slow our heart rate and our breathing. I invite you to think of it like good medicine. In fact, these practices that reduce stress are some of the best and easiest medicines to take, and they're free. 
It's scientifically proven that stress, my friends, weakens our immune systems. So in order to stay healthy during this time, it's especially important to participate in practices that reduce our stress. And we're going to work on that every week as we meet together. And I hope to do a midweek meditation for us too. Because no one else is going to do these stress-reducing practices for you. Others, whether on Facebook or TV or in your family, may heighten your stress by continuous talk about the situation. Now, many of these you can actually control by not becoming a news cycle junkie or gently telling others in your world that you're too tapped out to talk about the crisis at the moment. But either way, it's incumbent upon each of us, every single one of us, to intentionally do things that help us stay steady and that help us calm ourselves. Things that help us crawl back onto the riverbank. As the world falls into a crisis and we stare potentially the grim reaper in the face, I'm reminded of the exquisiteness of our existence. As we become limited in what we can do, everything, everything takes on more sacredness, doesn't it? Our relationships, our work, our food, our daily routines, they all feel more holy, don't they? Because we can't take them for granted anymore. And one of the blessings of this time is that we're treading more lightly on this earth now. Thanks to the reduction in air travel, driving and pollution, making a huge difference on our planet around climate change. What a blessing. Oh, I know, right? Yes. With the recommendation to go out less and stay at home as much as possible, many people are forced to slow down, to connect with their families, and be more present to the moment. Healthy food. And eat healthy food. That's right, because we have to keep our immune system up. I want to share words by the great theologian Howard Thurman who said, in the stillness of the quiet, if we listen, we can hear the whisper of the heart giving strength to weakness, courage to fear, and hope to despair. I'll post that quote on our Facebook page later. Being in that stillness, my friends, gives us the chance to offer gratitude for what is good in our lives. Nature is still abundantly available to us and inevitably has a calming, centering effect on us. Go for walks. Put your feet in the earth. Slow down. Watch the beautiful spring flowers emerging all over and taste the delicious fruit ripening on our trees here in California. In the tumult, read and reread poetry or scripture that comforts you. Like this beautiful poem by Wendell Berry, which gives me so much comfort. Many of you know it well, but I thought it important to share it with us all today. It's called The Peace of Wild Things. When the despair for the world grows in me and I wake in the night at the least sound in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be, I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water and the great heron feeds. I come to the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water and I feel above me the day blind stars waiting with their light. And for a time, I rest in the grace of the world and I'm free. 
I invite you to find readings that nourish you, scripture that gives you hope and sustenance. Listen to music that soothes and uplifts. In fact, the Metropolitan Opera is streaming their best performances daily starting on Monday, freely to, available to all at metopera.org. And many organizations are being creative and generous, sharing their content for free at this time. I also invite you to move your body. I'm so glad Torkel is dancing and I'm gonna be dancing too. Move your body now that you don't have long commutes and traffic jams to sit in, Yay. right? It's great. I know you have a really long commute every week, don't you, Kathleen? Explore the many ways that we can help each other online, and there are new ways arriving every day. And join us virtually every week at Chalice, my friends, for meditation moments online, for worship on Sundays, and in our small groups by Zoom, so that you remember that you are not alone in this. You have a raft full of people longing to embrace you in their arms once we can do so again. So in closing, as we navigate these times, I have a simple recipe for us all. Slow down, breathe, unplug from stress-inducing in, stress input, Find what steadies and nourishes you. Practice that every day, religiously, several times a day if possible. And connect to your inner or higher guidance. Give gratitude for what's beautiful and amazing about life, both within and around you. And do something that uplifts or helps another. And remember, my friends, you're not alone, no matter how isolated you may feel. You're connected by invisible strings to this beautiful community that cares about you. You're connected through Facebook, email, our newsletters, the phone, and our Zoom groups. And stay connected to others who are afraid and share your wisdom and kindness with them. My friends, may we as a community be ambassadors for calm and love. May we be ambassadors for hope and courage. And to use a favorite British phrase, keep calm and carry on. Yes. May it be so. I love you all. We love you.